What's up guys, Dr. Gooden back again to talk about essentials of strength training and conditioning, this time chapter seven, dealing with age and sex related differences and their implications into resistance training. Now in part one, we looked at how to train children and adolescents. And in part two, we'll be looking at differences if there are any between training men and women. So stick around until the end and we'll get the training recommendations from the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning textbook. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this chapter, written by doctors Lloyd and Fagenbaum, we will be looking at sex-related differences in muscle mass and strength and implications for resistance training. Okay, so the first thing to know about female athletes that you may be training is, of course, there are body size and composition differences. And I'm sure anybody who has taken a look at men and women knows that there are differences often between body composition and body size. There's a lot of inter-individual differences uh, within males and within females. Now before puberty, males and females are essentially the same height, weight, and body size. There's no difference between boys and girls. And if you recall from the last video, uh, that's because uh, boys and girls before puberty, there's no real difference in the hormonal uh, output in their bodies. And so there's not that uh, secondary sexual differentiation yet. Adult women, however, tend to have more body fat and less muscle and bone than their male counterparts. And in general, women tend to have a lighter total body weight than men. So lighter total body weight, smaller upper body frame, particularly less muscle mass in the upper body, uh, a little bit more fat mass. So le that leads to a different body composition. Recall that the peak height velocity for males and females is slightly different. Women for a while are actually possibly taller and heavier than males. We see them peaking in their height velocity, the rate at which they're growing at 12 or 13, while for males it's not really until 14 or 15, so a couple years later. Now in terms of strength and power, uh, for absolute strength, women generally have about two thirds the strength of men. And again, this is just, this is sweeping averages. Women tend to have about two thirds the strength of men. If, however, compared comparisons are made to just fat-free mass. So just if, if you could do some sort of a DEXA scan or skin folds, get the body composition, and then we calculate just for the fat-free mass, uh, or even the muscle cross-sectional area, we calculate that, then the differences in strength between men and women tend to disappear, right? They sometimes don't completely disappear for other factors, but they tend to disappear when we compare just fat-free mass or just muscle cross-sectional area. And so what this tells us is that a lot of this has to do with the body composition brought on by secondary sex characteristics. So the key point here uh, is that in terms of absolute strength, women are generally weaker than men because of their lower quantity of muscle. And relative, but relative to muscle cross-sectional area, differences in strength are reduced between the sexes which indicates that muscle quality is not sex specific. This is really important, you guys. It's not that women have some sort of inherently weaker type of muscle than males. It's just that they have less of it. And that's because their bodies support less muscle than males' uh, bodies support. However, if we can train uh, our female athletes and add some muscle mass to them and increase uh, or improve their body composition as far as sport is concerned, well, then now we're gonna start to get uh, closer, not maybe not attain, but we'll get closer to some of those male values. Here's actually some unpub unpublished data uh, that I collected with some colleagues, and this is looking at the vastus lateralis muscle thickness in college-aged athletes. And we can see that their muscle thickness, uh, females are here on this bottom line, in every case, no matter what type of athlete, whether it's weightlifting, tennis, soccer, cross-country, basketball, the thickness of the vastus lateralis muscle was uh, smaller for females than for males. Notice, however, that for our weightlifters, look at how high that was, right? That, that's higher than, you know, it's almost as high as our male tennis athletes, and it's definitely higher than our cross-country athletes. 
and it, you know, it's maybe approaching our soccer athletes. So with training, uh, we can add appreciable muscle cross-sectional area to our female athletes. And I guarantee you those female weightlifters were much stronger than our male tennis and soccer and basketball athletes, uh, even if they didn't quite have the same muscle mass. So there are also neural factors to consider as well. Here's another example um, in the sport of weightlifting. We have, I, I'm not sure if these are any longer world records. I think, I think this is back with the old weight classes, but we have Dang Wei who at a body weight of uh, under 63 kilos, she could total 262, quite impressive. At the same body weight, actually a kilo less for his weight class, um, Chen Li Jun could total 333 kilos. So if we do the math, right, that uh, I'm just ballparking, that looks like it's about 60 to 70 percent, um, or, or Dang Wei's total is about 60 to 70 percent of Chen Li Jun. So uh, we see even at the elite level, there's still this difference between males and females. And we can tell, you know, there's a difference in body composition there, to be sure, um, not to at all detract from Dang Wei's accomplishment. It's just this is a difference between men and women. Now, we also really want to consider when we are coaching females, the female athlete triad. This is really important because we want to spot any uh, indicators of this early and to get our athletes on the right track to get out of this. So this is the interrelationship between energy availability, menstrual function, and bone mineral density. This can be caused by high training volumes or high intensities or both, and the uh, um, a lack of, of optimal dietary intake. So perhaps we're not taking in as much energy as we are expending in training. This could increase the risk for not only osteoporosis, but also amenorrhea. Uh, amenorrhea is the absence of the menstrual cycle for three or more months. Here's a visual of the female athlete triad. So here in the green, we have what is optimal, right? We've got optimal energy availability. We have eumenorrhea, which is uh, the presence of a normal menstrual cycle. And we have optimal bone health. Now, in, in the presence of an inadequate diet or of some form of overtraining or increased stress, we can you know, slide down to this red triangle down here, which is, which is not where we want to be, right? Osteoporosis, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is essentially just saying that you know, we have an irregular menstrual cycle and low energy availability, and this could be with or without an eating disorder. A lot of people sometimes jump to conclusions that there's an eating disorder present, when in fact, sometimes there's not. And, and, or sometimes there's a, a different uh, thing going on there than an eating disorder. So we, you know, we have to be really careful with these and refer to specialists, bring in a team to help support our female athletes. So this brings us to our program design considerations for women. If women have about two-thirds the strength of men, and especially in the upper body, they tend to have less musculature, and we want to avoid this uh, you know, uh, female athlete triad, well, what are our program design considerations? Well, first of all, we want to think about upper body strength development. Because they have less upper body strength than men, maybe, and this maybe if this makes sense for the sport your female athletes are competing in, maybe we add one or two upper body exercises uh, in addition or perhaps additional volume for those upper body lifts for, for women. Not necessarily to catch up, but just to, to account for the fact that, hey, if they're playing, let's say, basketball, right? They have, women's basketball has very similar demands to men's basketball, so let's uh, increase the upper body strength of women uh, to be proportional to the lower body strength. We also want to remember that the high caloric cost of performing large muscle mass, multi-joint upper body lifts may aid in maintaining a healthy body composition. So I put, uh, you know, I put a star by this because this is the same for males as well. Uh, it says this in the textbook. I feel like this goes without saying though. Uh, it's not like it's any different from women. Um, I think though that the, a point was made to say this because sometimes, uh, and this is for like I don't know, cultural, social re reasons as well. Sometimes women uh, sort of shun upper body training. They don't want to do it. Um, and there's this unfortunately pervasive myth that like, hey, if you are a woman and you weight train, you're going to look like the Hulk or whatever. And that's just not true because women don't have the hormones usually to support that kind of 
increase in cross-sectional area. The point is, though, that if we can increase the energy expenditure by adding in some upper body training as well, maybe that can also help to improve body composition, which could be more optimal for sport. So don't neglect the upper body training. Other program design considerations. We haven't touched on this yet, but ACL injury is very common in women, much more common in women than in men. So what can we do? Um, well, because females are, are six times more likely to incur an ACL injury than male players, we need to address things like joint laxity, uh, account for the possibly smaller ligament size, um, and neuromuscular deficiency that leads to abnormal biomechanics. So as strength and conditioning professionals, we have to be aware of not only muscular strengthening approaches to protecting the ACL, right? perhaps making sure hamstrings are, uh, are strong in comparison to the quads, making sure that uh, the whole posterior chain is strong, so being able to, to use the glute and the hamstrings as a unit, uh, but also be thinking about neuromuscular training. So how are we teaching our athletes to land? Um, are we starting with really good plyometric progressions before we throw them into depth jumps? Are we teaching them to step off a box and to land and absorb force well with their knees tracking in the right directions, uh, uh, you know, avoiding valgus forces, those types of things? Um, here's just an example of uh, before and after neuromuscular training. So we see in this, this is a shallow cut, right? So this athlete is approaching from this direction and then cutting this way. So we see before neuromuscular training, we see a hip drop on this side. This hip is dropping. And we see this valgus knee collapse. These are bad things that's putting stress on the ACL ligament. Now with neuromuscular reconditioning. Now we have this neutral pelvis in the cut, which gives a nice stable base of support. Uh, it transfers forces better uh, and, and is just a more rigid body through which force can move. And we also now have proper alignment of, uh, of the knee, of the, of the thigh and of the shank. So no more knee valgus, and that's a good thing. Okay, further program design considerations. Uh, we need to remember that women, although they may start out weaker especially, uh, do, do not only to lower testosterone, but also because, you know, culturally, again, women tend to engage in resistance training less frequently, they start less early, um, and they, there's not as much of an emphasis placed on it uh, when compared to men. So women can actually increase their strength at the same rate or maybe faster than men. Also, because of their smaller body size and smaller overall strength, women may be able to handle, handle higher absolute loads of training percentages because their max strength or their peak strength is a little bit lower than men. Uh, any percentage of that will also be lower, right? If you're training at 80% of your 1RM, it's gonna be a lower absolute load. And although the effort might be the same as a, a man training at 80%, the overall uh, stimulus to the body may be slightly less and the damage that the body takes on is slightly less. In general, smaller individuals, not just females, but any smaller individual can, in, in general, train at a higher percentage of his or her 1RM or at a higher intensity and can do it perhaps more frequent, uh, frequently. And again, I'm, this is generality, but women tend to be able to handle higher training frequencies than their male counterparts. We want to implement neuromuscular coordination strategies for change of direction and landing for our females and our males as well, but definitely we need to be watching in our females to protect against those ACL injuries. And we want to consider education about the importance of muscular strength in sport and positive body image. We know this can be an issue for our female athletes especially, and so we really want to be um, careful and attentive uh, about, how, about what messages that we're sending across to our female athletes, especially our younger female athletes. All right, guys, so that wraps up the sex differences between males and females and maybe some approaches to programming uh, differently for females versus for males. But we're not done yet with chapter seven of Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. Uh, now, the next video, uh, click on over somewhere on the screen, we'll be talking about uh, training for older populations. And this is, a, this is a great population to work with. I've, 
I actually got my start working with some older populations. And so stay tuned for that video. If you found value in this, please don't forget to subscribe and like, and I'll see you guys in the next video. If so, why is that so? And this comes from Doc. Oh, sounds so dumb. Come on, don't be dumb. Okay. <clears throat>